Okay. Oh, yep, it's on now. Okay. All right. Very good. Okay. It's okay. Jamie, here we're going to give you a very short condensed version. If something is warm, it cools down. If something's cold, it warms up. Okay. The system is the ice cream. The surrounding is the earth. And we measure the system, and then we see what's going to happen. Or we measure the surroundings and see what's going to happen with the system. That's the short version. Okay. So here's the story. So there are certain equations that you're going to need to know, and this is very important in terms of the uh, overall system and how it works. So one of them is Q, and, and I'm, if you all did Chem 1, I know you all have seen this equation. It's M delta T C sub P, right? So M is going to be what? Mass. Mass. <clears throat> this is change in temperature, which is going to be most likely in Celsius. Anybody remember what C sub P is? <coughs> the specific heat. Okay. So, here's the classic example. All right. So, let's say that you have uh, a cup of water. Right. Have to have a cup of water. Has a little bit of water in it. Right. And let's say that the mass of the water is. 100 grams, and let's say that the initial temperature of the water is room temperature, call it 20 degrees Celsius. I throw it in the microwave, I measure the final temperature of the water, and it's warmed up to 80 degrees Celsius, and the specific heat of water, we'll talk about this number later, is 4.18 joules per gram degrees Celsius. Now, this is a situation, from my perspective, I always have to keep track of which lecture I'm giving this in. Because if I give this lecture in physics, the mass is in kilograms, and the specific heat is 4,180 joules per kilogram degrees Celsius. Chemistry would deal with slightly smaller values, so that's why it's joules per gram, and physics is joules per kilogram. But here's the point. What this tells you is how much energy it takes to change one gram of a substance, one degree Celsius. So with water, if you have a volume of water by the end of your pinky, that's about one gram, round numbers, okay? So if you have a mass of water about the equivalent of your pinky, and you want to change it from 20 degrees to 21 degrees, okay? You're just going to change it one degree, 20 degrees to 21 degrees. That takes about 4.2 joules of energy. So to give you some perspective, uh, imagine this is one kilogram. Okay, it's not, but pretend it is. This is one kilogram, which is about 2.2 pounds. So this is one kilogram. If I lift this up, I do work. So if I lift this thing, if this is one kilogram mass, and I lift it up to a half meter, that takes me about 4.2 joules of energy to do that. Okay, so if I lift it from here up to here, if this was a one kilogram mass, that would be about four <coughs> joules. So for every one gram of water, if you're going to change it one degree Celsius, that's the energy that it takes. Now, that's a relatively, for, for specific heat values, water has a very, very high specific heat. Okay, Metals, silver, gold, iron, those are, have much lower specific heats. So what that means is very, it takes less energy to change the temperature of a metal because it has a lower specific heat. It takes a lot of energy to change the temperature of water. So if you look at this calculation that we're going to do, we got 100 grams of water, not all that much, okay? We're going to want raise it from 20 degrees to 80 degrees. We're, we're not even going to make it boil, okay? We're just going to warm it up, okay? Not even anywhere close to boiling. It's going to be hot, okay? But it's not going to boil. So somebody... Grace, you got your calculator. So Q is going to be your energy. Now, for those of you that have taken or are in AP Physics 2, Q, this is not the charge, okay? This is energy. So Q in the, phys in the chemistry class, when you see Q like this, that's energy, not charge, okay? So don't say charge equals no. This is energy. So if you look at this, so we're going to have... 100 grams, this is change in temperature, and you could write this as T minus T naught, temperature final minus temperature initial. If you don't like that, you can write it as temperature final minus temperature initial, okay? I don't care, it's up to you. You can either use T minus T naught 
or temperature final minus temperature initial. It's up to you. And then we're going to have, which in this case is going to be 60 degrees Celsius, and then multiply that by 4.18 joules per gram degree Celsius. A miracle happens. The grams cancel out, the degrees Celsius cancel out, and I have joules left over. So, Gracie, take 100 times 60 times 4.18. <clears throat> 25,080. 25,080 joules. Joules. Okay? Now, to give you some perspective on how much energy that is, if this is a one kilogram mass and I lift it up to a height of one meter, that's about 10 joules. So to generate that much energy, I would take a one kilogram mass, I lift it up like this, that's 10 joules. So that would be the equivalent of lifting a one kilogram mass 2,508 times. That would be the same amount of energy. So I would have to do this 2,508 times to generate, and if I could harness that energy, that's how much energy it would take to warm up that water. So what this means in terms of you all is you go off to college next year or at some point have your own house and you're paying your own electricity bills. You sit there and go, wow, man, I'd love to take long, hot showers. Heating water takes a tremendous amount of energy. So if you're going, wow, my natural gas or my electricity bill is killing me, quit taking long, hot showers, okay? You're wasting energy and you're wasting water. Stop. Okay? Stop. So I'm just telling you because it takes such a tremendous amount of energy to heat up water. Now, what you're going to do in the lab tomorrow, there's going to be some questions like this on the lab on, on your homework today. So what we're going to do is you're going to take a certain mass of water. Let's say it's 100 grams of water. And you're going to dissolve maybe something like, uh, I don't know, calcium carbonate. So you're going to take calcium carbonate, and that's going to dissolve in water. Actually, it won't, because uh, calcium carbonate is insoluble. Uh, let's make it sodium carbonate. That's soluble. So sodium carbonate is going to break up into two sodium ions and a carbonate. Okay? If calcium carbonate was soluble, we wouldn't build limestone buildings because it would just dissolve. So let's say you have sodium carbonate. Okay? I'm just making up these numbers to stay with me here. And let's say that that's 10 grams of, cal of sodium carbonate. So we measure the initial temperature of the water. Now, here's what's going to be important. The water is the surroundings. Okay? The water is the surroundings. So we measure the initial temperature of the water, and let's say that that's 20 degrees Celsius. Okay? Temperature of water, boom, 20 degrees. I take 10 grams of sodium carbonate, and I dissolve that into the water, okay? Now, we measure the temperature of the water, and the temperature of the water goes up to 22 degrees Celsius. So, one of the things we'll talk about is that this is also what breaking bonds and forming bonds, okay? When you break bonds, energy is put into the system. When you form bonds, energy is released, okay? So what's happening on an atomic level is that you actually have two sets of bonds that are being broken and formed. So it takes energy to break the bonds that hold, like for example, let's say this is your sodium carbonate, okay? So here's your, whoa, here's your big carbonate, here are the two sodiums attached to it. So it's going to take a certain amount of energy to break the bonds that hold the sodium to the carbonate. So that's an input of energy, okay? That costs energy. It's an input of cost because you've got to break these. So imagine this. These are held together with little magnets. Boom. I have to put, in, put energy. Boom. There you go. But now these are going to bond with the water molecules that are in there. So if here is a water molecule, now what's going to happen is that the sodium ions... Are going, to be, are going to be attracted to the water molecule. Oh, they're going to form a bond. The carbonate is going to form a bond. So when you form bonds, you release energy. So because of the fact that the temperature goes up, that what that tells me is that more energy is released in the formation of bonds than it is in the breaking of bonds. Classic example. It's cold. Okay, it got cold last night, right? You woke up this morning, it's 30 degrees. 
Wow, it's cold, right? Okay. I'll start a fire. Cool. I'll start a fire. What's the for, from from a bond perspective? When you burn wood, or is inner is the net release of energy going out, or is the net input of energy going in? Which one is big? release of energy or input of energy? Release of energy. Okay. If the net input of energy was going in, the air around the fire would get colder, which would be really weird. Okay. Wow, it's really hot outside. <sighs> Let's start a fire. <laughs> okay, but no. If the if the net input of energy was in, you would start a fire and it would cool down the room. Okay, not very effective to cook food either. Okay, wow. Let's cook a hamburger. Let's start a fire. No, you're going to freeze the hamburger. Okay, because the energy would be flowing out. But burning wood, burning charcoal, burning natural gas, you get three things. You get carbon dioxide, you get water vapor, and you get heat. Okay. All three of those, which is what happens when, you, and that's what you all were doing, okay? You all are little furnaces. You are taking complex sugars, which are carbohydrates, and you're breaking them down, and you are exhaling carbon dioxide and water vapor, okay? And you're also getting heat, <coughs> which allows you to stay warm, okay? If breaking down complex sugars took in energy, your body would be actually always be getting colder <coughs> because energy would be going into it. Okay, now, here's what's going to be important. What we need to do is calculate the amount of energy, the amount of energy that was released, okay? So we're going to use that Q equals, uh, Q equals M delta T C sub P. Now, listen to me. The sodium carbonate dissolved into the water. So the mass that we're going to use is also going to include the sodium carbonate because it dissolved and became part of it. So the mass that we're going to use is 110 grams, okay? When the salt dissolves into the water, when the salt dissolves into the water, you have to add that mass to it because that's becoming part of the system. Now, Change in temperature. This is important. We do this right. Final minus initial. Oh, 22 degrees Celsius minus 20 degrees Celsius. Now, the specific heat of water is still 0.418 joules per gram degree Celsius. Yes, the sodium carbonate has dissolved into it, but it's still water, so we're still going to use the specific heat. Now, Gracie, give me this number. Take 110 times 2 times 4.18. Nine hundred and nineteen point six. So call it nine twenty. Okay. So what that tells me is that here's the water. All these little water molecules. So when that sodium carbonate dissolved into the water, that water absorbed nine hundred twenty joules. So one of the great laws of thermodynamics is it says energy cannot be created or destroyed. So what that means is if that water gained 920 joules, that means as the surroundings, how much energy do you think the system lost? Probably 920 joules. Let's go with 920, okay? So what we're always assuming is that these are well-insulated containers. This is why we do, like, like the lab you're gonna do tomorrow, you're gonna do in, in double styrofoam cup. So we're, what we want to do is minimize any heat loss to a bigger set of surroundings, like the air around it. This is why we don't do these in like tin or metal cups or even just glassware, because glassware is very, very a good conductor of heat that allows that energy to flow in and out. So this is why the lab tomorrow we're going to do this in styrofoam cups. Okay, now there's some different terms we're going to deal with in this whole unit. We're going to deal with delta G, delta H, delta Ds. Now, you already know what delta G is. What's delta G? Change in what? Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Let me give you a hint. 
It rhymes with Ibs free energy. Thank God. So you already know that that's is, right? That's Ibs free energy. <laughs> did, you, did someone say it? I whispered it at her. Zach said grab it. I was joking. Zach said grab it. I said God. Yes. Okay. Now, delta H is enthalpy. Okay? Now, and delta S is entropy. So when you look at, and this is all going to be about the units. So enthalpy, enthalpy is how much energy there is, how much energy there is per mole. Okay? This is going to be important. This is per mole. Entropy is a measure of disorder. Okay, we'll deal with a lot, we'll spend a lot more time talking about entropy later. Okay? So entropy is a measure of disorder. So like if you look at my desk, my desk has a very high state of entropy. It has a very high state of disorder. Okay? Back of the room, I've kind of tidied that up a little bit. I've kind of decreased that entropy a little bit relative to normally how it is. Okay, back off me. Don't be judgy. This is why I'm single. Okay. So no, it's true. Like, oh, your room is a mess. Back off. It's my room. Okay. So, entropy is a measure of disorder. Okay, that's all you need to know for now. It's a measure of disorder. The more messed up it is, the higher the entropy is. Okay? <laughs> so. Hey, Greg, how are you and your girlfriend doing about chats? We're good. <laughs> <laughs> I appreciate your concern. <laughs> okay. All right. So, one of the great, and we'll talk more about this later, this equation, do not worry about it for now. So, this is one of the most important thermodynamic equations that exists in all of the universe. So, basically, what this says is that if you take your entropy, multiply it by the temperature, Subtract that from the enthalpy, that gives you the value of Gibbs free energy. Okay, we are going to spend two days talking about this equation. But this is how all of them are related. So this is why delta G and delta H have the same units of joules per mole. Enthalpy is technically joules per mole Kelvin. So that way when you multiply it by the temperature in Kelvin, the Kelvin cancels out and then you're still left with joules per mole and that's what allows you to add everything together. So if you want to find enthalpy, okay, and technically it's change in enthalpy. Now here's the odd thing, we'll talk more about this later. If you look at these three, these big three, Gibbs free energy, enthalpy, and entropy, here's the anomaly. If you go to Amazon and type in, hey, I want to buy a Gibbs free energy probe, or I want to buy an enthalpy probe, or an entropy probe, they don't exist. So the anomaly about this is that these are the three most important quantities that exist in all thermodynamics, and we cannot measure directly any of them. Okay? Temperature, we can measure directly. Okay? We can measure that. But what temperature allows us to do, for example, in this situation, is it allows us to get the enthalpy, because the enthalpy is joules per mole. So I can't observe directly what's happening when that sodium carbonate dissolves. I can't observe that. But what I can observe is the impact that it has on the water that's around it. So that would be like me taking me taking something out of the refrigerator, okay, and I walk over here, and, and it's like, and you all think of it. Bert Camp's caught it, his Jesus slid off his crackers. Because I walk out, and I'm going, hot, 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 and I set it down. And, I get, and you all can't see anything. And you're going, really? Okay? You all go to Dr. Watts, you need to have an intervention. Okay? And I set it down. And now, because I'm going, oh, hot, hot, Okay? And you all can conclude. I don't know what it is, but it's hot. Okay? And then I set it down, and then I, we put a, a thermometer right beside it. 
And over a period of time, we see that the thermometer going up in temperature. It's like, hey, maybe working at this is so crazy after all. Because whatever it was is releasing energy. Because we can tell that by the temperature going up in the surroundings. You can't see the system, but obviously something was there. Because the air around it isn't going to increase its temperature on its own because Mother Nature is lazy cream it on it. So when you see the temperature of that water go up, you can't see the system, but you can observe the surroundings. And when you see the temperature of the surroundings go up, it's like, ooh, don't know what happened, but somebody got rid of some energy. So here's the point. We had 920 joules that was released. Now, this sounds biblical, but this is all about the signs. You have to watch the signs, okay? You have to watch so one of the most important signs that you're going to begin to notice is the sign of delta H. So delta H could be negative or positive. It's like square root, okay, plus or minus. Now, here's the first thing you need to begin to memorize. When you have a negative delta H for the system, okay, delta H is never for the surroundings. Delta H is always for the system. So when you have a negative delta H, that's exothermic. Okay? If you have a positive delta H, oddly enough, that is endothermic. Okay? Boom. First thing you need to begin to memorize. Negative delta H, exothermic, positive delta H, endothermic. If you don't know that, uh, everything else is going to be very, very difficult to get. Now... Here's the whole key to this. This is for the system. Now, here's the story. This is where hopefully this all makes sense. After a very impassioned lecture. So the water, is the water the system or is the water the surroundings? Water is the surroundings. Water is the surroundings. Okay, the sodium carbonate is the system. Oh, okay. This is the surroundings. Now, back up for just one second. The water gained 920 joules. Okay? Where did that come from? The system. Came from the system. So, look at this in terms of money. Okay? I walk in, Leslie's there. I said, Leslie, how's it going? She goes, it's a good day, Burkham. I said, really? What happened? She goes, I found 920 bucks. Cool. Cool. She's buying a lot of donuts. Okay? She's buying a lot of donuts. Right? Now, that money didn't come from thin air. If she if she has gained $920, which is cool, I'm happy for her. But guess what? Somebody lost $920. Bucks, okay? Sucks for them. I agree. They're probably drug dealers, so it's okay. So I'm just telling you, nobody has that much cash. Huh? He like carries cash like that. He looked at that look. Black turtleneck. Not look at that. Black turtleneck. Nicholas on the outside. He carries cash. And he works in the warrant. Yeah. Not even do drug tests. What? What? Over hundred. I'm just saying. Did you study? Do you study? Do you study for the drug test? Okay, good. Okay. All right. Okay. That's applied chemistry. Okay. Now, back to our story. Back to our story. Back to our story. So, if you want to find the enthalpy change for the system, look at the units. That's joules per mole, right? So what do you think I'm going to have to do with the 10 grams of sodium carbonate? Oh, oh I've got to find the moles of sodium carbonate, right? So do the math. Uh, oxygen is 16 times 3, that's 48. Uh, calcium is 40.1. Sodium is, what, 23? Sixty-four. So somebody take sixty-four plus forty-eight plus forty point one. Did you just try to do twenty-three times 
Okay. That's, I have dyslexia too. That was math. Dyslex I had the right numbers, okay? There you go. I had them, just the wrong sequence, okay? Maybe that's why the police never called because I called 119. Okay. Okay. <laughs> They don't answer. They don't answer. They won't pick up. Really? Yep. It's like a six something number. Yeah. We called 911 three times. They didn't answer. Four. That's scary. We don't hear about your rag. Okay, anyway. 40. What did you get? Oh, I just didn't do it. 134.1. Okay. Okay. So, now. Take 10 and divide that by 134.1. Oh, that's a 0.0746. <laughs> Moles of sodium carbonate. So if I want to find the enthalpy change for this reaction, I'm going to take the 920 joules. Now, here's the kicker. This is what's going to be most important. On the surroundings, listen to me, on the surroundings, you had a positive Q, okay? Because temperature went up. So that was for the surroundings. So for the system, if you have a positive Q for the surroundings, what do you think the sign is of Q for the system? Negative. negative. So for the system, I'm going to take a negative 920 joules, and then I'm going to divide that by the 0 0.0746 moles of sodium carbonate. And when you do that, what do you get? <coughs> Pretty big number. 12,337. 12,000 joules per mole. Call it 12,300 joules per mole. Now, I'm going to make that a negative. Okay? This is all about the sign. So, when you find the enthalpy change for the sodium carbonate, so you have a positive Q for the surroundings. That's in lab tomorrow. You're going to make, you're going to dissolve calcium, you're going to dissolve copper sulfate in water. If the temperature of the water goes up for the surroundings, the temperature has gone up, that means the system has lost energy. So that means you're going to have a negative delta H because it's exothermic. Energy is being released. It's an exit. Energy is being given off. Now, if the temperature had dropped, if the temperature had gone from 20 down to 18, here's where the magic happens. If the temperature of the water had gone down, which is one of the things that should happen tomorrow, one of the reactions, your temperature should go down. Then, when you take temperature final, if you take 18 minus 20, then you're going to get a negative Q for the surroundings. That means you're going to have a positive Q for the system. That means it's an endothermic reaction. So you're going to calculate Q for the surroundings, switch the sign, and that's how you're going to get your enthalpy for the system. Open the door! <laughs> Open it! That's awkward. <laughs> Open the door! Is it unlocked, Eli? Yes. Yes. Okay. <laughs> Just nobody tried. Well, because everybody else locks the door. I'm just going to put the door. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> I think I'm the one that does it. Keep that on the download. Nobody has. Okay. Now. Now, here's the next big one. Delta U equals Q plus W. So Q, we just talked about that in terms of energy. So here, energy is flowing in or out. So this is this this and this is what's going to be important. What you're talking about here is all about the sign. So if you have a positive Q, that means if here's your system. That means energy is flowing into it, okay? You're dumping energy into the system. You want a water bath, 
Okay, cool. You're going to take a beaker of water. You're going to put it on the hot plate. You're going to turn it up. Energy is going to flow in. That would be a positive cue. What? Yeah, like, what else would you bathe in? Yeah, that's what I was thinking. You should water bath, so I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> hey, maybe you're out of water. Maybe you get some, maybe it's an alcohol bath. I don't know. I don't recommend it, but, you know. Okay. Okay. Now. If energy flows out, oddly enough, that's going to be a negative Q, right? Okay, cool. Again, it's all about the sign. Now, W is work. Now, for those of you that have physics, you'll now understand the concept of work. For those of you that haven't, here's a short version of work. Work is some force acting over some distance. So here's the short version of work. If I take this and I lift it up, I just did work. I exerted a force over a distance. Okay? If I take a if I take a syringe, okay, and I push down like this to compress that gas, I do work. Okay? Because I've exerted a force over a distance. I pushed this down, I did work. Now when I let go of it that syringe goes back up. So when you talk about prepositions, it's all about the prepositions. Is work done by a system? Is work done on a system? So when I do this compression, I do work on the system because I'm compressing it. If I compress this and I let go of it, and that pushes that back out, work is done by the system. So if the volume gets smaller, work is done on the system. If the volume gets bigger, work is done by the system. Now, in terms of what we're going to do, we're going to use this idea that work equals negative P delta V. So that's pressure and that's volume. Now, here's the difference. Again, I always have to think about what, which class I'm in in terms of how I do the units. In chemistry, pressure is typically measured in atmospheres. Okay? So, typical standard pressure, what you all are used to existing under, is one atmosphere of pressure. So, standard pressure in a chemistry class is one atmosphere. Now, there's also a whole bunch of different ways to measure this. It's also, that's 101.3 kilopascals. Uh, that's uh, 760 millimeters of mercury. That's 760 tor. Uh, that's 14.6 psi, pounds per square inch. Okay, pressure has all these weird things. Main thing in chemistry, most of the time, you're going to be working in atmospheres. Now, here's the problem. Change in volume. In a chemistry classroom, typically the volume is going to be in liters. Okay? So that's going to be your final volume minus your initial volume. Okay? So here's the story. So if this syringe is pulled out, my final volume is bigger than the initial volume. So this is where you run into problems with units. So in a chemistry class, because you're multiplying pressure in atmospheres times liters, work in a chemistry class has these weird units of atmosphere liters. Okay? It's weird. It's atmosphere liters. Odd. Okay? But here's the problem. If you look at delta U, now let me explain what delta U is. Delta U is the, is the measure of all the different types of energy that exist within a system. So imagine you have a second grade class, okay? This is the amount of energy that exists from all of the Timmies in the room, 
Maybe Timmy is doing cartwheels. You got another Timmy doing doing jumping jacks. You got another Timmy sitting in the chair going, "This is fun, cool, okay, all right." And you got another Timmy just sitting in the corner in the fetal position, going, "I want my mommy." Okay, so you have all these energies, right? And Delta U is we're going to change the system. Maybe we're going to give the kids Skittles, okay, something like that. So if we give the kids Skittles, we're going to change the energy. Now, here's what's important. We don't know what the energy is. We're not talking about what the energy is at the beginning, what the energy is at the end. This is just the change in the energy, okay? So Leslie comes in, she goes, Burkamp, I found 920 bucks. That's cool, okay? Now, I don't know how much Leslie, how much money Leslie had to begin with. Maybe she had $10. Oh, she goes from $10 up to $930. Maybe she had a thousand dollars, and now she goes from a thousand up to nineteen twenty. Okay, I don't know. All I know is that that's how much her financial status changed, and that's all I care about. Great, you have nine hundred twenty bucks. Good for you. I don't know how much money she had to begin with. Doesn't matter. I just know that she gained nine hundred twenty dollars. So, this is change in energy. So it's a sum of two things. Now here's the problem. Energy is in joules. Work in a chemistry classroom is going to be atmosphere liters. Guess what? You can't add atmosphere liters to joules. Different units. You can't do that. So, on your lecture notes, if I may. So, on here, on the back side, okay, and if, if there's ever a sheet of lecture notes you read, you read these. So, on this back side, Right here, I have this handy-dandy conversion, okay? This says one atmosphere liter is 101.3 joules. You have, that's the, that's going to be the magic conversion, which is going to allow you to add joules to atmosphere liters, okay? So that's a number that you're going to need on today's assignment. So here's the situation. So let's say that I'm going to dump in... Fifty joules of energy. Okay, I'm going to put it on the hot bath. I'm going to dump in fifty joules of energy. Okay. So here's my system. Boom. I'm going to dump in fifty joules. So if I don't do any work, that fifty joules is my delta U because there's no work involved. You only do work if you change the volume. Okay. Because work equals negative P delta V. Okay. And the negative sign makes the signs work out. That's why that negative sign is in front of it. So I do 50 joules of energy is put into the system. Okay, there you go. Now, then I'm going to tell you that the system does uh, 300 atmosphere liters of work. Okay, so I'm going to take, and I want to find the delta U, which is Q plus W. So here's the problem. I can't add atmosphere liters to joules. Won't work. Okay, can't do it. But what's the conversion from atmosphere liters to joules? Which one's 1 and which one's 101.3? 101.3 joules. 101.3 joules. It's like the radio station. 101.3. Listen to the smooth tunes. And that is... Mm -hmm. One atmosphere liter. So guess what? The atmosphere liters cancel out. So I can take 300, multiply that by 101.3. Then I can add that to the 50. Now, let me give you a simple example of how work can be done on a gas. So put your hand in front of your face about like, and about like this, about this far. And have your mouth completely open and blowing your hand. How does it feel? It feels warm, right? Now, do the exact same thing, but then I want you to pucker your lips and then blow on it. How does it feel? feels cold. Because what you're doing is if you are doing work on the gas, you are compressing that gas as it goes between your lips. Now, Mother Nature doesn't like that. Mother Nature goes, oh, man, I hate being compressed, man. I want to be free at last, free at last. So Mother Nature is going to expand. Okay, and that costs energy because you've got to do this expansion kind of thing. 
So as that goes through, it cools. So if you have a bowl of hot soup, okay, you have a bowl of hot soup, it's like, oh, man, it's hot, it's hot. Got to cool it down. So there's two ways you can blow on it. You can blow on it like this with your mouth open, or you can pucker your lips and blow on it. Which one's going to cool the soup down for it? Which one's going to cool the soup down faster? You pucker your lips. Because the air coming out of pucker lips is colder than air with your mouth just open. Okay. Oh, I hate this. This is such a question. like 10 minutes. I know, but it just messes up my cheese. You're right, Evan. You did learn about that. You did learn about that. Thank you, Bertie. You're welcome. Huh? Do you think that this has been on there long enough? Yeah. You can pause it, too. Okay, look, look, look. You see this? I Yeah. I hate them. How can you hate grommets? We're in our engineering projects, we're making something with grommets. Oh, okay. Why are there two of them? Okay. Now, so let me kind of take you through this. So, delta E, which is a change in energy, is the same thing as delta U. Chemistry calls it delta U, or physics calls it delta U. Chemistry calls it delta E. It's the exact same idea. So, delta E and delta U mean the exact same thing. So, on this first one, this is all about the prepositions. So, on... When you calculate delta E, literally, all you have to do is add those two numbers together. Do not make it difficult. You add the numbers together. So when I say, which case does the energy flow out of the system? So that question about energy is not your delta E. Just focus on the Q value, okay? When I'm talking about energy flowing in or out, that is just about the Q. Then, in which case does... does the system, not they system. Does the system, just realize that was a typo. Does the system do work on the surroundings? So that's going to boil down to the sign of W. Okay? So on the lecture notes, I lay the, this whole thing out. If work is negative, that means work is being done by the system. It's costing it energy. If work is positive, work is being done on the system so you're compressing that gas. Uh, when you get to question number five, okay, so notice that you have a negative, you have a delta H of negative 296 joules. So what that means, this is a, this is a stoic problem. When you see that 296 kilojoules per mole, that's per one mole of sulfur and one mole of oxygen and per one mole of SO2. So when you get to question A, it says, how much heat is evolved when 275 grams of sulfur is burned in excess oxygen? This is a stoic problem. Take your 275 grams of sulfur, change that into moles of sulfur. For every one mole of sulfur, 296 kilojoules is going to be released. Now, how do you know that this is an exothermic reaction? How do you know energy is going to be, is going to be given off? Delta delta. You have a negative delta H. It's an exothermic reaction. Okay. When you get to question number uh, eight, okay, so this is like the sample problem that I worked. Coffee cup calorimeter, which is what we're going to be doing tomorrow, the unit dissolved 1.6 grams of ammonium nitrate, 75 grams of water. I give you the initial final temperatures. You want to calculate the enthalpy change. So there's a whole bunch of things you need to do on number eight, okay? First off, big idea. You're going to go at 25 degrees, you're going to end up at 23.34 degrees. Is the water warming up or cooling down? Cooling down. Cooling down. So that means, because you're cooling down, this is going to be an endothermic reaction, which means Q has to, for the system, has to be a positive value because you want a positive delta H, okay? Because it's going to be an endothermic reaction. Uh, when you get to number nine, calcium chloride separates into calcium ions and chloride ions. Notice that you have a negative delta H. Is this an exothermic or endothermic reaction? Exo. Energy is going to be given off. So let me give you a hint. The water is at 25 degrees Celsius. Energy is going to be given off. You want to find the final temperature. Does your answer to number nine have to be bigger or smaller than 25 degrees? 
small and bigger. <laughs> bigger because it's an exothermic reaction. Energy is going to be given off. Water has to go up. So let me give you a hint on number nine. On number nine, you're going to use Q equals M, temperature final minus temperature initial times specific heat. The first thing that you have to do is calculate Q. So you need to take that 11, here's the steps. You need to take the 11 grams of calcium chloride. You need to change that into moles of calcium chloride. You need to multiply that number of moles by 81.5 kilojoules per mole. The moles are going to cancel out and you get kilojoules. Now pay attention to the units. What units is specific heat in? Joules per gram degree Celsius. This, unless you change it, is in kilojoules. I can't have kilojoules on one side and joules on the other. Okay? You have to get those kilojoules into joules so the units work out. So you're going to multiply this to the number, you're going to get Q. You're going to know the mass, you're going to know the specific heat, and you're going to know the initial temperature. Solve for the final temperature. That's what you're after. But you have to switch the signs. You have to make Q in this calculation a positive number. And the reason that works is because you have a negative delta H. So when you switch that sign for the surroundings, it becomes a positive value. Okay? All right. I'm done. You're on your own. Go be free. I know you may southeast need to leave.